church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. That's right. Well, good morning. Good morning. If you are new, we just want to welcome you. Thank you for coming to Encounter Church. We are about six months old and sent here to really reach the city of Orlando. And we're just believing for greater things that God is transforming lives. He's doing what he did right. 2,000 years ago. He's still doing it today. So I'm Pastor Blake, and this is my beautiful and amazing other half, Serenity. Good so morning. welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you. Amen. Amen. So, um... There are Connect cards in the seats in front of you. If you haven't been here in a while or um, you're new and this is your first day, please fill this out, um, and then we'll collect it when we collect offering. And then also, if you have a prayer request or a praise, a praise report, uh, please do put it on here because yes. we do um, have a team and everybody, um, we have a prayer team, so we are praying for all of... Uh, we are a church that prays. We are. That's right. <laughs> um, so we are um, praying for everyone that asks for a prayer request. Yes. So. And also yes. celebrating with you. Yeah, so you get a chance to fill that out. But we have several announcements this morning, so we're excited to talk briefly about those. The first one is we're still doing our kind of spring clean, so we're collecting yeah. uh, supplies for the church. If you want to bring in paper towels, um, sanitary wipes, we're the whole list, the email we sent out as, uh, as well. But we're just collecting cleaning supplies if you want to bring some stuff in just to sew into the church, yeah. uh, just as a blessing. We we appreciate the, just the generosity of our church. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those that have already begun to bring that have already brought supplies in. Yes. So it's a, it's a big help. It's a um, big help, yeah. a big impact for sure. So, and if you aren't sure what to bring, but you want to bring something, see me um, and I'll direct you to Dawn. So if you don't know who Dawn is, <laughs> yeah. she, she's in charge of all that and she does an amazing job. Yes. So we're doing that. And then this Saturday as well, we're doing a little bit of a spring clean here at the church, mm -hmm. a little bit of renovation in preparation for kind of knocking down some walls, opening some, some things up up front. But we need to kind of reorganize, get things ready for that, move them, some things around. So this Saturday at 10 a.m., we're going to be gathering here. Yeah. We're going to be doing some of that, and then we'll have lunch brought here. We'll be here for a couple hours. It won't be all day. Trust me, I know we all have places to be. But if you want to come and just sow into this family, sow into this community, yeah. we would love it. We'd love to see you. We'd love to work alongside and it just shows that we're in it 
together. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's, it's it's exciting because we have some changes to come, like um, in the front room, and we're going to be doing some some different things. So I think yep. it's going to help with like the flow. We have a lot of people, so yeah, just opening it up. It'll yeah. be good. It'll be good. In the last announcement that we have, Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is right around the corner, and yeah. we're going to just kind of <laughs> own it because we have an after party usually at every month, but we're just yeah. going to move it to Cinco de Mayo. We say. We're here to party with a purpose, right? Because we're centered on Jesus. Yeah. But it's going to be a great time. We'll have tacos and festivities afterwards. But as fun as that's going to be, and, as, and the fellowship is important, and we're going to have a great time doing that, but it's also an opportunity to invite somebody. Yeah. Maybe someone that you've been praying for, maybe someone that's on your heart, or someone that you meet. It's a great opportunity for people to come in and experience the love of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah. and just to find fulfillment in God. Yeah. So this is why we do these things. Yeah. We're here to win the city. We're here to invite people to church. We're here on a mission, mm-hmm. and we're also here to have fun. That's right. And um, yeah, I mean, we're just a, ch- a church who believes in doing life together, um, creating community, creating avenues where um, you can kind of you know, you have more than just the the 10 minutes after church sometimes um, to be able to really connect with somebody. And so relationships are really important. I really like your outfit today. Wow. Well, thank you. Looking good, babe. All right. It is now time for the offering. So if I can have the ushers come forward, uh, we'll take up the offering. If you're new, there's no pressure on giving. This is an in-house thing. If you want to give, you can make the checks out to Encounter Church, or you can give online, mm-hmm. uh, the QR code behind me, or our website. Uh, and it's an opportunity just to sow into what we're doing, yep. all right, and to see this church make a difference. So let's just bow our heads, and let's go to the one who was first generous to us. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you that you use it for your glory and your kingdom, that it's, it's really about you about your purpose and your plan. So we give cheerfully and we give generously, knowing that you will do more with it than we could ever possibly imagine. So we give it all to you in your name. Amen and amen. All right. It is good to be here this morning. I'm excited for the word that the Lord has for us. I was in prayer this morning, and I just felt like the Lord just wanted to make us increasingly sensitive to his spirit. You know, if you love somebody, you want to know what's on their heart. If you have a friend, you want to know what's going on in their life. That's what makes them a friend. That's what makes them a loved one. That's what makes them family. As we've been brought into the family of God, We should have a desire in our hearts to know what's on his heart. The one who gave us life, the one who created us, the one who fashioned the universe. And to enable that, he gave us his spirit. Amen? So we've been given the spirit of God, and that's that's what we're looking at in this series called Icon. We're looking at the Holy Spirit. And really what God has given us and given us access through his Holy Spirit. We are on the second part of this series. And we're looking today at the wind of the Spirit. And we're going to be in the book of Acts. The book of Acts follows the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's right after those. It's in the New Testament, so if you can open your Bibles there or open up your phone and you can follow along, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 and then move on to Acts chapter 2 and we're going to read a couple verses there, okay? So Acts 1 verse 8 is where we're going to start. The words of Jesus to his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Then in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And really this series is highlighting the iconic moments of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And when we think of icons and we think of what it is iconic, you think of a number of different things that we talked about last week. Maybe it's the Eiffel Tower. Maybe it's the Capitol Building. Maybe it's Washington, D.C. Maybe, as we said, even last week, it's the Golden Arches of McDonald's. Getting real classy. But they're iconic. There are a number of different things that come to mind when we think of that. And there are moments in Scripture where the Holy Spirit is being highlighted in a particular way, and we want to study what's going on, what the Spirit of God is doing so that we can see the patterns of what he did in the past and what he continues to do in our day and age. Well, Acts 1 and 2 is really the foundation of the church. And Jesus tells his disciples to go and wait in Jerusalem for the promise, for the gift of God. That when they wait, the Father was going to give something to them. And a hundred... 120 of them go into the upper room and they wait upon the Lord and the Holy Spirit is poured out because our Father is a God who's generous and he loves to give. How many gifts? How many of you love gifts? How many of you are those gift people? Like that's your love language, like gifts. What are you getting me? What am I getting? My wife is a gifts person. Guess who's not a gifts person? Me. It's one of the things we have, we've had to work on in our marriage. I'm not going to say it's been perfect, but there's been progress. More so on my part. <laughs> but gifts are important, and they make us excited. And there's certain times of year where you get gifts. You get, you know, hopefully on your birthday, maybe. Christmas, depending if you've been naughty or nice. We all know the song. But there are certain times of year that you give gifts, and you anticipate, you know, what are you going to get? I remember when I was young, I got this incredible gift of this Lego pirate set. And it was awesome unpacking it, opening it up, putting it together. And I think I played with that thing until I was like, embarrassingly, like 19 years old. Maybe even still today. (laughs) But the father in Acts 1 and 2 is promising the gift of the Spirit. Now, why is that so important? Why is the Holy Spirit so important? He's not the redheaded stepchild of the Trinity that we avoid, but he's one person in the Trinity. And if our quest is to understand God, if our pursuit is the knowledge of God, we should seek to know not just the Father and the Son, but also his Spirit, which is called the Holy Spirit. We should seek to know the full counsel of God. And to do that, God has given us the Holy Spirit so that we could understand who he is. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, when you've come into Christ, you were sealed with the Spirit. But there should be a lifelong pursuit and passion for more of the Holy Spirit. To go deeper into what he's called you. To be increasingly filled. Well, Acts 1 and 2 are giving us insight into the Holy Spirit. And this is one of these iconic moments where the Holy Spirit is released and he comes upon the early church as this rushing wind. And really, Acts 1 and 2, there's so much here. As I was was studying in preparation for this sermon, there's so much here that we could do an entire series just on this passage. But really what God is doing is he's doing a new work through his church. It's an act of a new creation through the outpouring of the Spirit. We talked a little bit about that last week when we looked at the baptism of Jesus, that he's highlighting the act of a new creation, that where Adam had failed, Jesus has come as a second Adam to fulfill, and where humanity had gone astray to correct and bring us into a newness of Life. Well, in Acts 1 and 2, he's giving us, God is giving us his spirit so that we could accomplish this. And we're looking at Acts 2, and it's surrounded by the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost is maybe a term that you've heard in church before, and it really just means 50. 
50 days really after the resurrection of Jesus. And during this time, Jesus is speaking and teaching his disciples on the kingdom of God in preparation that they would receive the Spirit and go out in the fullness of it, and they could act as his messengers unto the ends of the earth. That how many of you know church isn't about just four walls, but we're called to be the light in the midst of darkness. We're called to be the salt in the earth. That we're called beyond these four walls to shine the light of Christ. So Pentecost, highlighting 50 days after Passovers, really what's being done here is Jesus is highlighted with a high Christology. In Acts 2, you get a very high Christology of Jesus. And what the scripture is painting is Jesus is coming as not only the Messiah, but the Messiah as God in the flesh and really as a greater Moses. Now, I don't have time to get into all of that today, but this is what's happening in Acts chapter 2. When Peter gets up and he gives this sermon and he's referring to Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 in in the... In the latter part of the chapter, he's referencing these important psalms that are talking about the Davidic covenant that God had made with the Jews a thousand years prior to that. And he's highlighting them to say Jesus has come as a fulfillment of the Davidic Messiah, but he's more than that. And he connects these psalms with an important passage in Joel chapter 2. In Joel Joel chapter 2, to give you a brief summary, I know I'm going fast here. But I want to kind of tie some of this together before we get on to the next part. Joel chapter 2 talks about God pouring out his spirit in the last days. Well, when Jesus comes, he sets the last days in motion. And Joel 2 emphasizes that God will pour out his spirit. And when Peter gets up in Acts 2 and gives this sermon after he's been filled with the spirit, he connects that outpouring with Jesus. He says, This has been fulfilled through Jesus in verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Meaning Jesus is the Messiah, yes, but he's also divine. He's also fully God. He's also come in the likeness of the Father. He's come to fulfill this. And not only is he come not only did he come as the divine Messiah, but he came as the greater prophet of Moses. He came as the greater Moses, which Moses prophesied about in the Old Testament. And Passover and Pentecost are really tied to that. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. And this signifies or highlights when the Jews were delivered from Egypt. They went into the wilderness and received The law on Mount Sinai. We know this story, right? We had the felt board when we were in Sunday school class. You know, they're going through the the Red Sea. They come out on the other side of the Red Sea. They go into the wilderness. They go to the mountain. They're all afraid to go onto the mountain because the Spirit of God comes on the mountain. It, It burns like fire. There's a sound of rushing wind. There's noise. And they say, hey, you know, Moses, we were excited to follow you out of Egypt, but we can't follow you up the mountain. You go up the mountain, Moses. They send Moses up the mountain. He gets the law from God and brings it back down, and he finds Israel in idolatry. What Acts 2 is highlighting is this is a greater moment. When God gave the Jews the law on stone, now he's fulfilling the prophecy in Jeremiah where he's going to not just write the law on stone, but he's going to write the law on the hearts of men and women through the power of of the Holy Spirit. And so the whole canon of Scripture is being tied together in Acts chapter 2, that this is a work, this is not only just the birth of the church, but it's an act of the new creation that God is sending his Spirit to do something new in the earth, to commission his people to be his witnesses and representatives here on this side of eternity. The Spirit of God was no longer going to remain just on the mountain that burned with fire in the book of Exodus. Now the Spirit of God was going to fill the hearts and lives of men and women and cause them to burn with passion for the love of God. Jesus is the greater Moses, and the Spirit is greater than the law. This 
is the beauty of God's story. That God is weaving together thousands of years of human history and bringing them into this perfect harmony. And so many times we're so afraid to say yes to God, but we forget he's the God of creation. We forget he's the God that holds human history in his hand. And what he did over the course of thousands of years, he can do in your own life today. You can say yes to him. You can surrender to him. You can allow your heart and your mind and your body to be filled with his spirit. And what's cool about this, what's amazing about these passages is, is that at the time, the Jews looked to the temple. And on the, on the temple mount, and on the temple mount stood the temple where the presence of God was housed. But now what's being highlighted is it's not just going to be housed in the temple, which was then destroyed in 70 AD, but it wasn't just about a place. It's now about a people that we as followers of Jesus get the honor, get the privilege to carry the spirit of God wherever we go. You and I are now little mobile temples or mobile homes for Jesus. Should be a new t-shirt. You're a mobile home for Jesus. But you are. We are together. That's what's so amazing about it is that his presence gets to live in our hearts and our minds. Now we have the power through the Spirit to live the way God has called us to live. Where Israel failed, now we can succeed. Though not perfectly, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is progress in our lives. And as I began to think about this, I thought about this old kind of analogy, or I thought about this. You know, anybody ever want to or try to write like a great writer? Like that was like, you know, just like, I like to write. And it's like, man, if I could just write like Shakespeare, and then you go to write something on the page, and it's like, the cat jumped out of the hat. And you're like, that's all I got? That's it? Or maybe you like sports, and you're like, man, if I can just dunk like LeBron James or like Michael Jordan in that dunk contest where he makes that famous dunk, and you realize you got to lower the 10-foot rim to, like, the 6-foot rim. You know, it's like, ah. you're like 8-foot. You're like, ah, maybe another foot down, ah, another, another foot down. And you really just can't do what you thought you could do. This often can be quite frustrating. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, where you're trying to do something, you're like, you see it, and you're like, I can do this. I got this. And you go to do it, and you're just like, man, this cake just turned out a little flat. And this, this poem turned out to just be a bunch of mumbo, mumbo jumbo. Well, this famous writer also had this experience, and let me read this quote to you. His name is William Temple. He's quoted by John Stott, the famous theologian, and he said this. It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear. Those are, that's Shakespeare for you uncultured ones, okay? In telling me to write a play like that, Shakespeare could do it, I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that, which I think we've all been there before. Jesus could do it, I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me then I could write plays like his. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like his. You see, we can't do it in our own strength, just like I can't dunk like LeBron no matter how hard I try. But if the spirit of God can come and live in me, then I can live a life like Jesus. And that's really the significance of Acts 1 and 2, is that the same spirit that was in Jesus, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, is the spirit that's been given to us. This is what Acts 1 and 2 are about. And you may ask, well, what is this gift about, and is it worth waiting for? Is waiting on the Holy Spirit, is asking for the Holy Spirit worth it. And I began to think about this, and I, I, I thought about this in this analogy because I play sports. If someone told me I could throw a football like Tom Brady, and all I had to do was wait for it, do you know what I'm doing that day? I'm waiting. And I don't care how long I have to wait. Appointments be cleared. 
friends set aside. Whatever is going on, I'm clearing my day and I'm waiting for that gift because I know what it can do. I understand that Tom Brady was one of the, he is the GOAT. You want to undervalue him. The best quarterback in the NFL. And if I can have that same gift, I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to clear my day. I'm going to make time for it. I'm going to open it up. Or maybe it's not sports that you relate to, but the great British Bake Off. Yeah, I understand. I get it. Serenity puts it on, and I get sucked in as well, too. I walk by, and I'm like, what is this? And then like an hour later, I'm like, oh, what's the next one? Can't wait to see what Paul does. And for the great British Bake Off lovers that are very cultured, if I could cook and evaluate like Paul, and all I had to do was wait, I'm waiting. If I could have as good as hair as Paul. But too many times we lack the wherewithal to understand what God has truly given us. He's given us his spirit, the one that created the heavens and the earth, the one that scattered the enemies of God, the one that empowered Jesus. This is the same spirit that we've been given. And as I begin to think about this, it was like, you know, it's, it's like kids sort of understand money. They sort of understand money. Like if I give my daughter a dollar or a hundred dollar bill, she knows there's a numerical difference between the two. She knows that there's a difference between the one dollar bill or the hundred dollar bill. However, what she really doesn't understand is the buying power between the two. She knows there's a difference, but she doesn't understand the buying power. Some of us know that there is a Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is good, but we truly don't understand the power that we've been given access to. We haven't been given one dollar or even a hundred dollars. We've been given something that you can't ever put a price tag on. That's what can, can empower your life. It doesn't mean your life is perfect. It doesn't mean your life is easy, but it means that you can operate in the same spirit, in the same unction that Jesus did. So what do we have in this passage of scripture here? It's really the good news of that. And today we're trying to understand what that good news is. Well, Acts 2 gives us some more insights into it. Like the mountain in Exodus, the Spirit of God descends with great noise, fire, and a rushing wind. And in this instance, this iconic moment in Scripture, the Holy Spirit descends as wind. Well, what's one of the defining characteristics of wind? It's invisible, unfortunately, right? Can't see the wind. The wind is invisible. And it's probably the most frustrating characteristic about it is that you can't see it. If I can't see it, it's not real, right? Well, I'd say that's a gravity, okay? But it's one of the most frustrating char- characteristics. And like gravity, we still operate by the terms and laws set by gravity. Well, the Holy Spirit operates with certain characteristics in certain Laws. And as I began to think about this, I thought about the movie Hook. Anybody a fan of the movie Hook? It was one of my favorite Disney movies growing up. It's about Peter Pan. And I remember, I'm going to be brief on this story. I remember he, Peter Pan grew up and now he's an old kind of out of shape old man that's been brought to Neverland. If you don't know Hook and you're not American, go and watch it after service today. Okay. Pastor approved. All right. He comes back to Neverland to save his kids, and they're trying, the Lost Boys are trying to make him back into Peter Pan, and he's really having a hard time, and he's exhausted after a long day of suffering and being humiliated, covered in paint, not being able to fly, fight, or crow. Last one's very important. And he goes to dinner, and you can smell the dinner and all the scent of it wafting through the air, and you can see the satisfaction on his face when he smells the dinner, and he goes to sit down, and all the plates and all the stuff is brought out, and there's nothing there. He can't see it because the food is invisible. And just because we cannot see the wind, 
like the food in Peter Pan, doesn't mean that we cannot experience it. But it takes an act of faith. It takes saying yes to the Holy Spirit, even when you can't see him, even when you can't understand him. And when Peter in the story says yes and participates with what's going on, all of the food appears. The revelation of the food manifests in front of him. But he has to take that step of faith. And maybe your step of faith looks looks like setting aside time each day and saying, God, I know your spirit's real. I may not feel it. I may be going through a difficult time. I may not want to do it, but I'm going to set aside time as an act of faith and saying, Holy Spirit, God, speak to me today. Move upon my heart. I want to grow in my act of faith. I want to participate in what you are doing. When we do this, the revelation of the Holy Spirit comes to life, much like the food in Hook. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is like the Spirit. You cannot control the Holy Spirit just like you cannot control the wind. And in some ways that can be frustrating. But when you actually take a step back and think about it, it's probably best that we can't control the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit succeeds. And I know I don't always succeed. There are many times that I fail, but his spirit never fails. So when he's in charge and I'm moving forward, I'm walking in victory. I'm walking in truth. It may not feel like it. It may not sound like it. It may not seem like it, but God is doing something in your heart, and that's the act of of faith. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. He always connects the dots. That's what's so beautiful about Acts 2 is he's connecting the dots of what he had promised the Israelites thousands of years before. He's connecting all the dots and fulfilling them in Jesus and through the creation of his church, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's connecting all of these moments together, which we fail to do in our own day-to-day lives. He does over centuries. I would much rather him be in charge, than me be in charge. But it's an act of faith. It's an act of surrender. The wind creates, it connects the dots, it establishes. The wind in Greek can be pneuma, which also means breath. And it has the same meaning in Hebrew, ruach, which also means the breath of God. And what God was doing in Acts 2 is breathing upon his church and giving it life as he's connecting the dots from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and he's sending them out. Well, what else does wind do? The next point is wind strengthens. Wind strengthens, and I briefly talked about this kind of last week. But not only does wind blow through the trees and you can see it and you can feel it moving through nature, but when it blows through the vegetation, when it blows through the grass, when it blows through the plants and the nature around us, it's actually also strengthening the grass and the trees. When a new plant or a new tree is coming up and the wind blows upon it, it causes a tree to release a chemical called oxen. Write it down, fun fact of the day, oxen. A-U-X-I-N. And really what this chemical does is it releases growth and causes a multiplication multiplication of cells. When the spirit blows, it causes growth and multiplication. This is exactly what's happening in Acts chapter 2. They receive the Holy Spirit in the power of the Holy Spirit, and immediately the church begins to grow. It increases It grows not only in depth, but it grows in power. It grows numerically. Over 3,000 were baptized in these first couple chapters of Acts. This is what's happening. But it was just 
But it was just power that they received with the wind immediately in Acts with, with Peter and John. All right, so what's going on here is when the church is multiplying and growing, the Holy Spirit is releasing power just like it does in the nature when it's facing resistance. That's where I was going at that point. I was wondering. The tree and the vegetation need resistance to grow. So not only does the church multiply and grow in Acts 2 and 3, but immediately they face resistance. Peter and John, as they're going forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, are then arrested by the religious leaders. And, they, and the church faced resistance from the Jewish leaders at the time. But not all resistance is bad because resistance often trains us to grow stronger. Sometimes God brings us into a place of testing, not because he doesn't love us, but because he wants you to grow stronger because he loves you. Because of love, he sends you sometimes into places that are uncomfortable. Oftentimes we have the wrong perspective on comfortability in a life of ease, where God is more concerned about our character and what he's developing on the inside of us, and we're often concerned about how comfortable we are at the moment. And I get it because we all love comfort. We all love to just kind of check out. We all love to take the easy route at times. And the same thing could be applied at the gym. If we went to the gym together and actually never put resistance into play, you wouldn't get any stronger. And as soon as the Holy Spirit blows upon the church, he sends them into a moment of resistance, not to cripple the church, but to demonstrate the power of the church and so that the church would multiply and grow in strength and demonstrate that ultimately, despite what man throws against us, despite whatever season of life you're in, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you, which can cause what seems like an impossible situation to be turned around. When the prison doors are shut, he can open them. When the blind eyes are closed, he can open them. In the different seasons of trial and life, he is with us. And even though Peter and John are arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin and commanded not to preach about Jesus anymore uh, in the next couple chapters of Acts, they don't give up. What do they do in Acts chapter 4? They go right back to the place of power, which is the place of prayer, of asking for the Holy Spirit to meet them in their season of trial. So many times we just want to give up. So many times we just want to let go, and the Holy Spirit is like, just ask me. Just ask me. This is also why we're brought into community. This is also why the church is important, because you're not alone in this. Sometimes you need a John in your life. Sometimes you need a Peter in your life. Sometimes you need a Paul or a Silas in your life that are going to come alongside of you and say, let's go to the Lord in prayer about this. You know, your marriage is faltering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your kids wandered away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your family member sick. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's allow the Spirit of God to act in this situation. Let's move in faith. Let's see what he can do in our lives. In Acts 4, we see the church do the same thing again. And again, the spirit is released. The church wasn't crushed by the commands of the religious leaders. No, they asked for courage and boldness that they would continue to preach the gospel, that they would continue to live lives of love. Why? Because after the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were all in. They were all in. We just had Baptism Sunday, which was an awesome, an incredible Sunday. Fantastic day. Loved it. My favorite day so far as a church. Baptized nine individuals. And if you were baptized, we just, you blessed us. Baptism Sunday was awesome. And when you get baptized, you have to get into that water. And sometimes the pastor lies to you and says the water's not cold. It's all relative anyways. So... But you got to commit to the process, whether that water is cold or not. And then you have to allow the preacher to dunk you under the water. And depending on if the preacher likes you or not, he may hold you under a little longer than you want. No, we wouldn't do that. 
I just saw a video of this church baptizing this guy. And I don't know if they were trying to kill him or baptize him, but they held him under for a solid 30 seconds. But baptism isn't just about getting into the tub and just dipping your feet and saying, I'm good. But you have to surrender to the process and go under the water. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. God is looking for people who aren't just wanting to dip their toes, who are just wanting to try a little bit of God, a little bit of the world, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit whatever you want to sprinkle in and in some sort of syncretic religious practice. No, he's looking for people that are saying, yes, your yes doesn't always have to be perfect, but God, I promise you, will bring progress. I promise you, God will bring progress. You say yes to him every day. He'll allow growth in your life, strength in your life, power in your life. How could he not? He is a good father. He is a good father who loves his children. And God is just not looking for people who just want to dip their feet in, but go fully in. And this is what was promised when John the Baptist saw Jesus, that when he came onto the scene, that he said he's not just going to baptize you with water anymore, but he's going to come with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know what the cool thing about baptism is when you get out of the baptism, and when you get out of the baptismal or our trough, our glorified trough, it was a beautiful trough, you're dripping wet and sometimes a little cold. And water is splashing out, spilling everywhere getting on everything, and maybe you're hugging people that really don't want to hug because you're wet, but you take the hug anyways, and it's a beautiful moment, but there's an overflow. There's an overflow, and this is what we've been given through the Holy Spirit, is we've been given an overflow. You've been given an overflow that should spill out of our lives into our friends, into our family, into our jobs, into our community. That's why we're planted as Encounter Church. It's not just to keep the presence of God inside these four walls, but so that it would spill out, that others would experience the love, the power that we have through Jesus, that we would be his witnesses When Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4 and 3 and 4, and they go and they go before them, the testimony was given in those scriptures in the courtroom that these were just simple fishermen, but you know what was different? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. You may not be a fisherman, you may be a mechanic, you may be an engineer, you may be a pastor, you may be a teacher, you may be a professor. But you have the same opportunity that Peter and John had 2,000 years ago, that the testimony would go forth that it doesn't matter what your career was, but that people around you could tell these people have been with Jesus. These people have been with Jesus. And this is why we exist. When people come into our doors, when people walk into the sanctuary, we want them to leave with the testimony that these people know Jesus. These people meet with Jesus. Last point. The wind sins. The wind sins. We've already been kind of highlighting that through this entire, I mean, that's really what the book of Acts is about, sending the church out from Jerusalem until the ends of the earth. But the wind sins. God has given us power. He's given us authority. Why? Just so we can hoard it? Just so that we can hide it? under a basket, just so that we can stay within our walls? No, but so that we can be his witnesses. You and I and us as Encounter and us as the church in Orlando and around the world, we get the privilege of carrying the presence of God wherever we go. Think about that. You have the privilege that wherever you go, his presence is with you. And just as we cannot control the wind, he does not give us the power of his spirit so that we can do whatever we want. Rather, he gave us his spirit so that we can go and love on the lost. So we can go forth and call forth orphans who don't really know who their father really is. We have the good news inside of us. 
that we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to share with a lost and broken world that's looking for something real, that's looking for something authentic, that's looking for something true. They sing about love, they talk about love, but they've never really experienced the love that you and I have, the love that we get to have in our hearts, in our minds, in our community, in our fellowship. That's what the world is looking for. That's what the world needs. It's his the children of God going forth in the power of his love and the power of his spirit. And this is exactly what we see in the book of Acts. Acts 2, verses 5 through 8, quickly. In there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Verses 12 and 13. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? And others mocking said, They are full of new wine. What we see in the book of Acts is that the disciples just don't stay in the upper room. How boring would the book of Acts be if they just stayed in the upper room and they didn't get out? Day 1,245, still in the upper room, Peter just ran out of cheese. We just ran out of bread. It'd be like some apocalyptic movie. No, but they went out with the power of the Holy Spirit. The upper room was a greenhouse. It was a catalytic moment that birthed the church and sent the church forth. Just like when you're having a baby, your goal is not to keep the baby inside for 10 years. Praise God. Some of you women are like, thank God. Right? After that full term comes, it's time for the baby to go forth. It's time for the baby to move on to the next stage of life. So with the church, the upper room was a catalytic moment, something that they returned back to. But it was was a birth canal that birthed the church with power and life in something new. They spill out into the street, speaking other languages. This was a sign for all those around them that the Spirit of God had been poured out. Something miraculous that the Jewish Believers at that time probably hadn't seen in over 400 years because the Spirit of God had been silent until John the Baptist and Jesus came on the scene. But it was a testimony to an unexpected Jewish community around them that were gathered for the feast that the Spirit of God was being poured out. Then what happens next? It doesn't end there. Peter gets up and preaches the word without any preparation. That's actually what they nicknamed, nicknamed him after that. No preparation, Peter. Actually, I don't know. That's, that's the BSV version of the story, the Blake Standard version. We don't know. But he gets up and he gives a sermon. You're like, well, no big deal. We'll go down to the Florida Mall and give a sermon, just off the cuff. Go down to the Millennium Mall and just give a sermon off the cuff. I've done, I've done situations like that, downtown Orlando and Boston and other areas. It's a difficult thing to do. And it's usually not received very well at all. But at this moment, Peter was being led by the Spirit. He gets up and he delivers this word and people's hearts are cut. And also you have to think about, who is this man giving this sermon? It wasn't that long ago that this same man, Peter, was hiding in a room. Because they had crucified Jesus. Just before that, he lied to a little girl about who he was so that he wouldn't be identified with Jesus. He wasn't exactly bold in the past few, you know, seasons of his life. His courage, his courage and his boldness had been taken from him at the greatest moment of trial, and he hid in a room. But now this man, this same individual, this same Peter gets up filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit and preaches to the same crowd that cried out to crucify Jesus. His cowardice had been turned to courage. Some of us need that in this moment, in these seasons of life, to a lost and broken world, to a nation that refuses to bow to the name of God. He was led and emboldened by the Spirit. 
And the key is we're not keeping the Holy Spirit to ourselves, but we're to allow the light of Christ to shine forth. And you may be thinking, well, that's good for Peter. That he was able to get up and speak. But that's not really for me. And that might be true. You may never get up on a street corner and preach the word. You may never go to the Florida Mall and preach the word. But it doesn't mean you don't carry his presence. It doesn't mean you don't carry that same spirit that emboldened Peter. It may just look different. It may just sound a little different. You know what? That's the beauty of the body of Christ, that each of us has been given given different gifts, different callings. It looks differently. It acts differently. We speak differently. But you know what? It's the same Holy Spirit that wants to empower you. And maybe it's not a crowd, but maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's not a street, but it's a family member. I don't know what it looks like for you or what it looks like for me, but I want to be obedient to where the Spirit sends me. Amen? Let's bow our heads. This morning as I was just in prayer, in preparation for today and just asking the Holy Spirit, what's on your heart? What's on your heart for today? And I I almost feel like it's just, it's a reminder, but it's also a commissioning. And I feel like I want to remind us as Encounter Church that we're not to keep the good news in these four walls. But that same spirit that sent the early church out into the city, into the community, is the same spirit that we have access today. And I don't know what is going on in all of your lives or even who is in all of your lives but maybe they're there for a reason. Maybe they're there because like the people in the streets in the book of Acts, they need to know who their father is in heaven. And maybe you're there to show them through the power of the Holy Spirit, the love that they can truly experience. And maybe you're saying right now, this is too much for me. I don't know how. I don't know what to do, but neither did Peter, neither did John, neither did any of them. But what they did was they acted in faith and said yes to the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you every day to take aside time and say yes to the Holy Spirit, yes to the things of God, to ask the Holy Spirit, where do I need to go today? What do I need to say today? I am yours. You are mine. So, Father, we come before you right now, God, and we just embrace this moment and just say, we are your church, God. We are your church, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you just begin to fill our hearts and our minds, that you continue to transform us, that we would go forth from this service in the power of of your Holy Spirit, that at Encounter Church, we would be a people who say yes to you, Holy Spirit, that we would be a people who set aside time each and every day, that we truly value and treasure the presence of God. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you fill us even now. Fill this group of people. Empower them with that same spirit, that blew upon those in the upper room in Acts 2, that we would walk in the same fullness, the same power, and the same understanding. And right now, I just want to pray for anybody just, Lord, I know that people in the room that are just going through ups and downs, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a sickness, Maybe someone they know has undergone surgery or whatever it may be. But Lord, you know, you are the Holy Spirit. And we lift those requests up to you even now. Go ahead and just lift them up in your own way. Just say, God, I give them to you. I speak life. I speak healing. I give you may not even have the words to say, but just say, God, I give it to you. He knows. He knows better than you. Father, we thank you that we can come before your throne, which is above every other throne. 
give our requests, give our praises to you because you are worthy in your name. Let's go ahead and sing. Let's close with one song. Go ahead. Lead us, worship team, if you would. Let's just stand. Let's just allow his presence to fill our hearts as they lead us. Oh, my ground for you. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the wall of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my